Watch Dogs is dead. In 2023, Ubisoft has projected an average of $537 million in losses for the fiscal year. Because of that, they've started an initiative to double down on their most popular and best-selling franchises. Assassin's Creed, Far Cry, Ghost Recon, The Division and Six Siege were the ones they mentioned. But the one name that never got mentioned was the Watch Dogs series. In combination with quiet whispers from behind the scenes that it's been quietly discontinued as a franchise, it's fair to say it's not looking good. A game that was once upon a time one of their best-selling titles, what Red Dead Redemption was to Grand Theft Auto, Watch Dogs was to Assassin's Creed, making it even more surprising that it has been put to rest, dead and buried for years to come. Why? Our story begins at E3 2012, where Ubisoft unveils a so-called gameplay demo for their new IP titled Watch Dogs. The gameplay of the open world shown is revolutionary by today's standards, let alone back then. People are amazed at the incredible feats that Ubisoft have been able to achieve, an open world that can not only stand up to but surpass Rockstar's Grand Theft Auto V. Gorgeous graphics with immersive weather physics, never seen in games before. Somehow it appeared that Ubisoft had been able to jump leaps in front of every other developer at the time, surpass the industry standard and revolutionize gaming. A city that can be manipulated by the player with more than just bullets, being able to hack into people's phones and cameras, as well as raise and lower road blockers and cause blackouts. No developer had ever done something quite like this, and obviously people were very interested. How could they not be? This would end up being one of the most memorable trailers in gaming history, but not for the reason Ubisoft was hoping. And come launch day, everyone would find out why. On May 27, 2014, Ubisoft's second most pre-ordered game of all time would hit the shelves. That day would be a pivotal moment in gaming history as to why you should not pre-order video games, especially from Ubisoft. The internet would be flooded with comparisons. Mothers would even find the files for the original demo in the game, showcasing that the trailer shown was nothing more than smoke and mirrors, orchestrated by Ubisoft. All the fancy graphics and weather effects were gone, a major downgrade from what people were expecting. It was the biggest catfish in gaming history at the time, the first of its kind. Many players started creating videos exposing Ubisoft's downgrades and showcasing the differences from the trailers and the finished products. It was major damage to Ubisoft's reputation, one they have never truly recovered from. But what about the game itself? Was it all a lie? Not really. A lot of the core gameplay features were present. The game was still revolutionary in the extended parkour and hacking features it offered. It had a lengthy cinematic story and really did offer a lot of new, never before seen features that were enjoyed by the majority of players. The game received mostly positive reviews from both critics and players. However, something that needs to be mentioned is that although it sold quite a lot of units at release due to pre-orders and such, the controversy behind the downgrade did affect its long-term revenue. Now that is huge, and here's the reason why. Although Ubisoft had gotten away with their deceit at the time, a lot of people's eyes were opened, and with all of the negative attention it had gathered them, it meant players would be significantly more careful in their next purchase for one of their games. Ubisoft were about to learn a very harsh and bitter lesson, a lesson many clickbait YouTubers would learn years later. Clickbaiting or catfishing your audience can be beneficial for short-term hustling if you were to just take the money and run. But if you're interested in sticking around and continue to exist in the environment by putting more investment into future projects for that same audience, then losing their trust 
by deceiving them is the worst thing you could possibly do. Ubisoft had become the face of false advertisement in the gaming world, a harsh reality they would find out when they would decide to create a sequel. On the 8th of June 2016, a cinematic trailer would debut for Watch Dogs 2. It would be one of many trailers focused on advertising the game, but this time around Ubisoft appeared to have learned a lesson. There were no more over-the-top demos being shown or crazy promises being given, just a really good follow-up to fans of the original. It featured a brand new set of characters who would become iconic in the series, no one more than Wrench, as well as returning characters from the original, like T-Bone. Taking place in San Francisco, the city was beautiful and the story was a lot more lighthearted this time around. It was a big shift from the dark tone of Vaden Pierce's hunger for vengeance. Instead, focusing on a group of young hacktivists trying to take down evil corporations. The gameplay actively urges towards stealth and less lethal takedowns. You have brand new toys to play with, from a drone to an RC jumper that allows you to infiltrate areas without having to step foot in them. It gives tons of options for different tactics and freedom of approach. Though the lighthearted teenage humor the game had may have been a drawback for some, there's no denying that it took the formula of the original Watch Dogs and improved it in many areas. And guess what? No one bought it. Well, not quite, but it did underperform in sales in comparison. Here's what Ubisoft had to say. It is true that the first day and first week sales for a number of big games, including Watch Dogs 2 and titles from our competitors, are comparatively lower than previous versions in previous years. However, we expect both week 2 and week 3 sales to be above traditional sales patterns. It is clear that gamers had learned their lesson. Don't pre-order games from Ubisoft, no matter what you see in trailers. However, the game was reviewed rather favorably. It had mostly positive scores and ratings from both critics and players. It wasn't long before the positive word about the quality of Watch Dogs 2 spread out among players, which slowly got more people back into the series. Long-term sales of the game have been strong due to the positive word of mouth, Ubisoft boss explained in a just-finished financial call. It's good news. Despite all the controversy throughout the years, Watch Dogs was able to endure, survive and in some cases thrive the market. With Ubisoft back in good favor with fans and standing behind their title, it was clear the franchise was here to stay. It would take a gigantic, colossal disaster for them to let go and abandon it. Speaking of which... Watch Dogs Legion, a game I literally bought an entire gaming PC for at the time. Yes, that's how hyped I was for this game. The most hyped I've ever been for a video game in my life. But can you blame me? The whole Play As Anyone feature sounded amazing. On paper, that is. But right there we find the chink in the armor. Because Watch Dogs Legion's main selling point is also the fatal flaw. This one is personal. Legion's focal point feature is allowing players to recruit anyone in the open world. Meaning, there's an insane amount of operatives, all with different abilities at your disposal. Now, that may sound great on paper, but there's more than a few giant flaws. Number one, by making everyone playable, it means there's very few operatives that feel unique. And those operatives that are unique, like the hitman with the fiber wire and assault rifle, the spy with the silenced pistol and personal vehicle, and the Albion guard with the disguise, are the only operatives really worth playing. Customization is significantly hurt by that, as now your hitman 
can't have a silenced pistol, as the silenced pistol is exclusive to the spy. The Albion Guard is the only one capable of using handcuffs as their takedown and equip a disguise. The spy can't equip any melee weapons like a baton or fiber wire. It makes every character very restricted in their loadout. Not to mention, it gets even worse because the majority of characters have really bad voicing. So, we're friends with Babylon now? Police! Looks like everybody's losing their blood clot minds. Give it time. The firms will shrivel up without their mother's tit to suckle at. Extremely over the top accents and a lot of times characters' voices don't fit with their look and age. When it comes to the story, I have to say that it's one of the most bland, boring, uninspired and half-assed put together stories I've ever seen in a video game up there with Battlefield Hardline. When you have no main character, it's very difficult to immerse yourself into a story, made worse from the fact that the first 50% of the story moves along at a glacier pace, with barely any cutscenes whatsoever, and it's so poorly told you won't know what you're doing most of the time, just going to different places to do different missions, but you have no clue for what purpose, as you're constantly being told about characters and groups groups you've never met or know nothing about. It's an extremely difficult to grind through story, as you'll actively feel discouraged to go back into the game. The game lacks any strong side characters or villains that could carry it forward. Everyone is just so boring and unemotional, it makes progression feel like a chore. Another big problem is the game's optimization, at least on PC that is. It requires a minimum of 10 gigabytes of VRAM and a 30 card or better to run properly. It's an extremely demanding game, and anything even remotely less than that will have your game freezing, especially on cutscenes. The core gameplay, however, is a lot of fun. There's a ton of freedom of approach. All of the trespassing areas and fortresses have multiple ways they can be penetrated, including with a spider bot from distance. The driving is rather complicated, heavy vehicles really struggle to move around corners and do feel more immersive. On the other hand, bikes feel very arcadey. Taking corners feels overwhelmingly easy, often causing you to oversteer. They lack any weight or momentum behind them. The songs on the radio aren't anything to write home about, but there are a few good ones, depending on your taste. There's also a podcast-style station as well, speaking on the rise and success of cryptocurrency and how it's replaced the British Pound. Talk about aging a game, bet they didn't see that one coming. If you make it to the SIRS story, it's actually pretty decent. It takes place after you're 50% into the story and has a ton of cinematic cutscenes and plot that's very easy to follow. It's the only chapter that's done halfway decently. I'm sure the developers had a hint that it could happen, which is why they would release Watch Dogs Bloodline only a couple of months later. A DLC for Legion focused on Aiden Pierce and Wrench as the main protagonists. It's a love letter to loyal fans, the game starts out strong enough, but the story, much like the main game, suffers from repetitive grinding of the open world activities, made even worse from having all of your original abilities removed and having to re-unlock them by completing missions. Though the concept is better as it allows you to unlock weapons for different characters, having to do it after finishing the original story of Legion can feel like an overwhelming chore. It's insane to think that Aiden Pierce and Wrench can't hack a simple drone without doing a side mission first. The story is significantly better than the one of Legion, but to be fair, it's almost impossible for it to be any worse, and the cell figures perfectly reflect that. Despite Watch Dogs Legion having decent sales at launch, it was so buggy and broken and had so many bad reviews and scores 
from players and critics alike, it quickly fell off the hype train and never really got back on it. It's a sad tale of a game that clearly had a lot of potential in it. The insane amounts of animations for takedowns alone showcase that this game was not cheap by any means. It had a lot of funds put into it, but the direction they took the game into and the extremely poor design choices hurt it big time, the microtransactions and the in-game store didn't do it any favors either. Thankfully, all of these items can be acquired for free through Nexus mods. It's really sad how a franchise with so much potential finds itself on the ground, not because of anything else, but just blind ambition on the developer's part. With Grand Theft Auto V at the end of its rope, Legion was the perfect chance to develop that open world game that players have been craving for almost a decade by now. And although in my opinion the game is worth picking up on a discount, it's by no means the blockbuster success it should have been. And the solution was so obvious, just give players character customization and have recruited characters give them perks like different weapons and items they can equip to build the perfect character. It is possible through mods, but it's something that should have been done in the game day one. Maybe one day we can see a game like that, but I doubt Ubisoft will be the one to put it together. Until then, Watch Dogs Legion will go down in history as one of the biggest what-ifs to ever happen. A game with insane potential that just never lived up to it. But at the end, you have to let sleeping dogs lie. Until next time, this has been Wild Gold, and thank you very much for watching.